ha, that feels so much better. Uh, we just need to get started now. That was a little um, break for us. And um, I just wanna say thank you to the Cambia Center for having me. I actually uh, wrote this lecture two years ago and uh, I feel like we're in a much different place now. So it's been interesting to read back my slides um, in the context of everything that's happened in the last two years and the last year. Um, and I really just wanna give a shout out to everybody working on the front lines right now. Um, you are seen, you are heard, and I appreciate you. And I also wanna thank um, all of my teachers and colleagues. I you know, in presenting this material and much of it I've learned throughout the years in my practice. And that's because of the rich learning environment that I've been honestly just very blessed to be in. Um, the University of Washington and the Seattle area is just a beacon of um, knowledge. And I'm just so appreciative of having grown up here um, in this culture. Um, I wanna thank also just my coworkers, my families, and also my students. I do teach for the University of Washington and some of you are on this call and um, you're about to launch into a career that feels really uncertain. And um, I just wanna know, I, you to know I see you and I hear you. And also just as we move forward, remember I'm not a licensed uh, psychiatrist. I am here to provide some evidence-based um, suggestions, but it's not for everyone. And so um, these ideas are some things that have worked in, in different studies. Um, there are things that have worked for me, for my colleagues. So um, there's not just one roadmap. And so if you need help, please reach out. There are so many resources. The university now has a peer-to-peer -peer support program for nurses and staff, physicians. Um, my good colleague, Marie Cockerham is involved in that program. So I just want to let you know that um, help is available. I myself see a therapist. Um, you know, I think we all need to be transparent about mental health right now. So with that, um, a personal roadmap. So I don't know if you all can see my screen, but this is something my daughter drew. It was a map <laughs> of, how, of uh, wellness. Can you see that, Alice? Or maybe you could just chat. Are you able to see that? Um, so I just don't know where this map is, is going, but it made me laugh and um, it basically she talked about pizza, bikes and babies and a picnic and some playtime and going on a boat to Idaho. So if your personal map to wellness looks like this, I think you're doing great. <laughs> um, anyway, we'll go to the next slide. Um, so with that, I just want to um, make a a statement about Dr. Stu Farber, who was a mentor to many people, including myself. And he was basically a pioneer in helping us understand the importance of narrative medicine. Um, and I was lucky to work with him on several projects as a nurse at the University of Washington. And he, um, you know, basically founded this program with um, Dr. Randy Curtis at the Cambia Center. And if any of you know Stu or remember him, he was just the most amazing provider. He would come into the unit with, I remember always had a vest on, which is very casual and um, just made you feel seen and heard. And he was the strongest advocate for palliative care. And when I started in the ICU, I'm dating myself, palliative care didn't really exist. He, it was, it was a struggle to get palliative care. It was just sort of this budding new profession and working with Stu was an honor and I'm so grateful for his teachings. And um, one of the quotes that always sticks with me um, is he wrote, our job is not to write the patient's story, but to be a good editor. A good editor helps you tell your story. A bad editor tells your story for you. And as we move through this talk, um, I am going to be discussing some of my own personal journey narrative studies. Um, experiences because it really helped me to understand what what it means to be resilient and and go through a lot of the trauma the collective trauma that we're all going through in this current healthcare environment so with that we'll move to the next slide and um as you guys have watched this amazing um fantastic seminar there's been tons of great lectures and 
um, I just want to recognize Dr. Curtis, and he spoke about this idea of value when we talk with families at the end of life. And um, he's published on this um, some really great papers. And I just like to remind myself of that. And when I'm teaching my students and when I'm working with residents, this little um, mnemonic has been really helpful, you know, not only for how we connect with families, but I think also in our own lives, you know, that everyone has a contribution to the discussion. Um, we need to acknowledge emotions, listen, understand, and elicit questions. And I feel like that that is um, very helpful in any setting we're in, whether or not it's in a hospital with end of life conversations with our colleagues during maybe a difficult conversation at home with my five year old. Um, I just I just really love this um, mnemonic, and you know I kind of curtailed that to my own little mnemonic, which is on the next slide because um, you know Dr. Curtis is so influential that I thought for us as healthcare workers we could take the same value and just remember that we are human. Verify that you are a human taking care of humans during a pandemic. Like that is a heroic thing in itself. And, you know, as you're moving through these really, really tough times, it's important for us to understand and assess our emotions, because when you don't understand your emotions, just like when we're trying to elicit and understand our family's emotions, we need to pay att attention to our own emotions, because if that gets like stuffed down, it causes all sorts of other sequela, which we're going to go into on the next slide. Um, I also really encourage, I'm sorry, don't keep on this slide, sorry, in the next, let me, I meant next slides coming up. <laughs> Um, but also leaning into your intuition. I feel like as a nurse, bedside nurse, um, as a provider, we have this sixth sense that we're trained to utilize. You know, it's like when that patient, you come onto your morning assessment, stick on your stethoscope, and they're like, hey, I feel like I'm going to die today. You listen to that. Like, nothing's happening clinically. Like, there's no bips in their vital signs, but something just isn't right. And so, Listening to your intuition can be really helpful as you're, you know, going through this path of wellness. And then please understand that growth is a journey, not a destination. This talk we have together isn't going to, this doesn't happen overnight, right? Like we are trying to get ideas about how to help ourselves, but it's a daily progress. And sure, there's days where we're not going to be well, and we're not going to feel invigorated by our profession, and we're going to feel sad, and that's okay. Um, this is a journey, right? And our careers are hopefully going to be long. And um, just know that you are worthy. You are worthy. You are showing up. You showed up onto this webinar today, and that is a lot. So value for our families, Dr. Curtis, value for us. Next slide. So um, yeah, I have some objectives here, and it's just a framework for how to go through this talk and particularly when we're doing our CEs. But, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit about burnout and resiliency. We're gonna talk about medical ethics, which you had a lecture on, I think earlier um, during this webinar. And then maybe, just maybe through this talk, you'll be able to identify two to three strategies for yourself. And that's really my goal. And even today, if it means you had um, just some breath work, you got your Starbucks, maybe you ate a good lunch. Hey, that was a wellness map you just did for yourself. So be proud. Okay, next slide. So um, like I said, I wrote this lecture two years ago and then the pandemic hit. So we are living in unprecedented and ongoing challenges. Um, this time is, is bizarre. And so I think just being mindful of that as we move forward in a wellness talk is you know, I, I absolutely thought this time last year, things would be different. I thought, you know, maybe naively, probably very naive, that everyone would kind of come together and we wouldn't be seeing another COVID surge, but that isn't the case. And um, it's really, really tough right now. Nurses, providers are extremely burnt out. And um, again, I don't have the answers for all that. All I can all I can do right now is focus on you and getting you to feel good. <laughs> so um, the healthcare times are changing. We'll go to the next slide. 
And I will say it's very complicated. Obviously, working in healthcare has been complicated for a very long time, um, but it's it's now even feels more so, right? Um, I think it's important that um, we talk about obviously the distress that's been happening in the sense of COVID, the amount of um, you know lack of family presence, um, doing Zoom calls at the bedside while your patients pass away. Like these are things I've never seen in my career, and we're seeing for the first time. So um, just knowing that this time in healthcare is unprecedented and it, it's getting more and more crazy. So next slide for this. Um, what I do know is that the healthcare system is, is really under a lot of strain, right? And it has been for a long time, but now it seems even more apparent. Um, basically this slide shows the amount of money that the US spends on healthcare. And you can see that it's nearly double of any other country in the world. It's that big blip. Um, but yet our life expectancy is 27th in the ranking. Um, our spending is obviously a lot, but it, it lacks return on investment. And, and these things are very complicated. And this slide, by the way, is from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, and we can see here that the population um, lives increasingly longer, but yet the healthcare increase is, is more up. So what I'm saying is that the US stands out by following a much flatter trajectory. So gains in life expectancy from additional healthcare spending are much similar to that, to much smaller, sorry, than in other high income countries. So we spend more, but don't necessarily have better quality of life. And so um, what does that mean? Uh, it's, it's tough, right? Well, what we're seeing is a lot of money is spent obviously on critical care. Um, you know, more, a lot of countries have socialized structures, which I'm not gonna get to into this slide, but um, we can even see just in public health, the amount of distress happening with vaccinations. And so preventative health in the US is very much um, a cultural variation compared to a lot of the other countries. And we are seeing um, an economic crisis from that. The um, gross domestic product that the U.S. spends on healthcare is obviously extremely high. So, um, with that, we'll go to the next slide. And um, this, you know, talks about medical technology. Which, what's amazing about working in the ICU and why I love it is intensive care. There is intense treatments. You know, we can do amazing things. And since the advent of the hemodialysis machine and the mechanical ventilator in the 1950s, we've been able to save lives and, and, and extend life, right? But um, it's, it's getting more complicated. Despite all this medical technology, there's still a lot of uncertainty. And so I think that's obviously where palliative care can come in to sort of bridge those gaps between, yes, you're hoping we can get your loved one better, but we still are very, very uncertain. And so, um, it makes it complicated, especially for the bedside provider and nurse. And I think for all of us in this healthcare arena right now, um, we're seeing a very polarized and scrutinized political and legal environment. So we're sort of in the midst of all of this drama going on. And it, it again, can cause a lot of burnout. Um, we're seeing longer life expectancies for people, but with that, a lot more functional impairment. So you're seeing patients come into the ICU with a lot of chronic comorbidities, and they may be going on life extending treatments. And it sort of is a bridge to we don't know. And that might not always be the best option, especially when it collides with maybe the patient's quality of life and what they perhaps expected, right? So um, that informed consent about what it means to have all these life-sustaining treatments. Um, and then again, there's just a lot of individual, cultural, economic, um, educational, and religious diversity and meeting the needs of all of these groups and people. It, it's tough, you know? I mean, I'm going to say it, it's been very difficult um, 
to have patients coming in with the variant, um, seeing them extremely sick and going back on the ventilator in the midst of having a vaccine. It, it's, it's really hard. And I think every bedside nurse is feeling that um, stress. And right now in the Seattle area, we don't have enough nurses to care for these patients. So that's another reason. Go ahead to the next slide, why we're feeling this burnout. And then I just wanna to touch a little bit about ethics because when we discuss moral distress, um, it's important for us to think about the framework for ethical reasoning in the United States. And we use this idea of principalism and this guides how we care for our patients, right? It's, it's, it's the foundation of our practice. And so um, respect for autonomy, this is number one. And I work in the Veterans Association and serving our veterans autonomy is so important, particularly because it's a vulnerable population who maybe didn't have a choice when they were in the military about what things they were exposed to or, you know, areas they were forced to fight in. Like, it is extremely important for the veterans to have autonomy. Um, and so that is a center of the American biomedical ethics. Um, and so when we look at that, respect for autonomy, number one, the individual. Um, and then we also talk about beneficence, which is clinicians acting in the best interest of their patients. Um, Non-malfeasance, no, I'm sorry, non-malfeasance, I can't say it today, more coffee. Um, and that's for clinicians to do no harm. And then this idea of justice or this ethical principle of justice that requires all people be treated well and fairly and that healthcare resources be used equitably. So you can see how this is, this is the standard, right? And this is what we want. And oftentimes it comes into direct conflict with the patient or the provider at the bedside. Next slide. So um, talking about a lot of challenges here, medical ethics, uncertainty, um, high technology, sicker patients, older patients, and COVID. And then on top of that, we have our brain. <laughs> so our brain um, is, you know, primed to survive, not always thrive. So what I mean in the context is of the healthcare worker. And um, as that person at the bedside right now, we are facing ethical challenges, right? These direct conflicts happening every day. And what that does to the brain over time is this kind of, um, it's, it's a malignant response. So obviously in, in, in the first sort of stages of a stress response, for example, today I was like really pumped up about this presentation. I got on the Zoom early with Alice because I want to be prepared. And I had like, you know, I'm sweating a little bit. I'm feeling a little anxious, but it's making me be on point, right? I'm able to be organized. I've got my slides down, I'm ready. And the stress response, this like, I'm ready to be into action is it's beneficial, you know, it's helping me, but it can over time uh, be triggered by things that maybe aren't so stressful. Um, and so your brain starts to constantly be on the watch for threat. And that's where like complicated stress issues come out. And so um, an example of this can be, you know, being in the ICU and seeing your COVID patient come in, intubating them, knowing that they're not gonna be able to see their loved one, going up on the pressers, trying to get into the room, but put on your PPE correctly, um, families calling, they can't come in, patients decompensating and they pass away and no one was there. Like those are the type of stress responses that our bodies are dealing with right now. And it is incredibly difficult and leading to, a, you know, trauma and this distressing situation day in and day out. So um, with that next slide, we're going to talk in, in when I go into the wellness parts about how to sort of mitigate that stress response um, when you're at the bedside, which obviously is not always easy. Um, and then I just wanted to also talk about, you know, demographics are changing right now. So 
Um, like I said, currently in Seattle, there is not um, enough staff. The staff is very short to take care of these patients. Many nurses are retiring, many physicians moving on. Um, and there is not enough of us. <laughs> so that also is contributing to a lot of the issues in healthcare right now. Next slide. So um, as I've been talking about with moral distress um, and that, that issue with the stress response, this is a great slide to look at um, kind of what is happening at the bedside and you can sort of put it into three buckets. So there's these internal constraints, external constraints, and then clinical situations. And, um, you know, obviously with palliative care in the ICU, this idea of futile treatment comes up a lot. Um, inappropriate care, seeing patients in pain, um, false hope with families, Poor communication is definitely an external constraint. Dr. Kim, um, she gave a lecture on conflict resolution and really focuses her PhD work on the poor communication and, and that hierarchical struggle that happens because you know oftentimes in conflict, especially between like I work in an academic center and so um, there's resident staff, there's house staff, there's attendings, there's fellows, there's me, there's the nurses, there's the stat nurses, and so everyone kind of is in this system and there's different levels of who's in charge all the time. And so having a way to communicate, especially in those stressful situations can cause some of that moral distress if it doesn't go correctly. Um, and then the, the maladaptive coping and the fear, um, those are some of the internal constraints that we all deal with um, on a daily level. Next slide. So this is actually um, uh, a slide from one of my coworkers, Dr. Adamson, who is a uh, clinical attending at the VA. And she works with the ICU fellowship program at the University of Washington. And this is some data that shows, you know, what, what does all this stress and burnout do? And really you can see obviously poor provider wellness um, is a big problem. Increased sick days definitely happen. Um, people calling out, just not wanting to come in, they're just exhausted or, or they are sick. They're physically just unable to come in. Um, people wanting to retire early or go part-time. And then the decreased quality of care or decreased patient satisfaction. And that is really why institutions are incredibly um, interested in how we can help our providers be better because we know when providers are better and they feel good, patients are more satisfied because they do better or they feel cared for more. Next slide. So um, I just wanted to point out some emotions or symptoms of what can happen with this chronic stress and burnout. Um, it's I think important, like I said in the beginning of the slides with our value mnemonic, to be aware of our emotions. And so I point this out to you to understand maybe you know, your emotional exhaustion um, is coming from this moral distress, right? Um, we also know that interpersonal conflicts can increase. Um, folks may have more um, issues with addictive behaviors or maladaptive coping. Um, again, frequent illness, calling in, sleep problems, rumination or like insomnia, very common and only on the rise, not only with healthcare professionals, but with everyone in society at all. I mean, um, you know, hopefully I think with parents having kids on Zoom last year, a, a lot of my community members were incredibly stressed by that and not able to sleep. Um, this idea of over-identification or over-involvement with with a case or with a situation with patients. The compulsive triad. So this can often happen with novice providers or new hires um, that may be burnt out. And again, that's like that um, over identification or if there's a bad outcome, they may really take it very seriously. Um, 
like own the bad outcome thinking it's their fault. So that over identification, um, anxiety, irritability, detachment. So our apathy, just not caring anymore. Um, perfectionism, definitely been in that boat. Avoidance, apathy, error. So medical errors have been linked to chronic stress and burnout and then job loss. So people just leaving the profession. So next slide. You may be asking Des, that was really depressing. So what are we gonna do? Well, there is hope, there is hope. And I want you to know that the previous slides were just to give an example of like where we have been and what's been going on. So you can understand that we are working in a very complicated infrastructure as humans taking care of other humans. And this has a sequela. It has a um, effect on us. So now we're gonna move on into um, you know, what we can do. And that's on the next slide. Um, everyone is in this talk is a caring individual. I want you to know that you are caring, you are competent and you're compassionate, right? So compassion and empathy are real things. And, um, you know, compassion is the sympathetic consciousness of an other's distress with a desire to alleviate it. It's not to fix it, because again, that can lead to pathological issues, but it's a, it's a consciousness. You're compassionate, you're aware. And then empathy is an emotional engagement, highly present um, ability to understand what someone else is going through. It doesn't mean you're there to rescue them, but it means you're able to relate. And so these two things are really important as an ingredient to understand how we can be compassionate, empathetic, but also, you know, hold people accountable. That's like my, that's like my new wellness <laughs> trajectory, accountability. Next slide. So what does that mean? What, how does compassion and empathy get you to be resilient? Well, um, resilience is a, basically this idea of a way of adapting in the face of adversity. Um, it's also a way to have personal growth through adversity. And just so you know, it doesn't mean that you're not gonna experience distress or challenges. And it's not a personality trait. It can actually, the evidence shows that you can become resilient throughout your life. And um, it helps you, becoming resilient helps you get through difficult certain situations. It empowers you to grow and improve your life. Um, um, some people think that it is a personality trait, but like I said, it's, it's a way in action. It's a way to learn. And as I said, in the very beginning of the slides, this is a journey, right? Like resilience doesn't happen overnight and it's a way of bouncing back. It's a way of understanding and surviving. And I think all of you, all of you on this lecture are resilient individuals. You all are, you've been dealing with this pandemic, global pandemic that we've never seen in our life um, and you're doing it. So um, I guess I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> Next slide. So um, just to talk a little bit about the study. So how does it mean that you become resilient? Well, there's an article by Mount who is, um, a lot of these studies have been done with psychologists who deal with trauma, specifically um, significant uh, childhood trauma um, or sexual trauma. And what it is, is this idea that the clinician's feelings or their life is enriched by watching their patient or the patient's families grow through this trauma. And so it's this idea of like um, becoming resilient through watching yourself or someone else grow through and change in a difficult situation. Um, and this can happen um, spiritually, it can happen personally, and um, it's basically this idea of focusing on moments of connection. And, 
these happen all the time in our clinical settings. It's just basically attuning to that moment and creating this sense of um, responsibility and recognizing the connections. Next slide. So as I said, resiliency is this ability to overcome challenge. Um, it's a way of experiencing or coping with trauma where you yourself experience growth. And this changes your self-perception. It can change your philosophy of life and your interpersonal relationships. And what one of the um, psychologists was quoted in saying in the paper by Mount that I actually have all these resources at the end of the slide is that when I see my patient's improvement, I often see my own. And with that, we can see this tolerance for human fragility, not fertility, <laughs> increase, fragility. Um, and it can often be conscious. It can sometimes be unconscious. So again, it's facilitating this growth and understanding um, where you're meeting your patients in that moment. Next slide. So how do we get there, right? How do we get to this resilience straight? Well, I'm gonna go over the next couple slides on some different strategies. Again, you all are gonna make your own roadmap, but there are several evidence-based strategies to look at when we're talking about growing our personal health and well-being. We're gonna talk a little bit about social strategies, physical strategies, cognitive strategies, and meeting-based strategies. Next slide. So one of the ideas here is that we have to remember that self-care is not selfish. And um, I love this because it's, you know, always, they always teach you on the airplane, put on your own mask before anyone else's, because as we move through this time um, and we don't take care of ourselves, we're creating more harm, right, to ourselves and to our families and to all those interpersonal relationships that we foster. And so when we give care to ourselves, we give care to those around us. When we give care to ourselves, we give care to those around us. And so it's kind of a mind shift, right? Because um, I think, especially as a nurse, you go into this caregiving field for whatever reasons, but particularly because you wanna be a service and help people. But if you're constantly helping others and not yourself, you're going to feel the effects of burnout and, and, and not enjoy it. So um, we can move to the next slide. So one thing I think that's really helpful is for us to identify common self-care myths. And this can be a great start to how you change your behavior. So I'd love to practice this with you guys. If anybody, if you wanna just take a moment to open up the chat. Um, uh, what do you, anybody wanna talk about some myths about self-care? that they themselves tell themselves or what they've seen maybe on social media? Any ideas? I'll take a sip of water. Um, okay, I'm not seeing anybody, so I'll, I'll just go into it then. Um, oh wait, here we go. It's just another thing you have to do. Thank you. Um, yeah, right? It's like, oh, another agenda item. That's really good. If I get burned out, it's my own fault. That self-care is selfish. Thank you, Dr. Curtis. Well, let's reframe as the uh, Cambia Center has taught us all about how to reframe some of these self-care myths. So, um, I like the one that self-care is selfish. Can I start with that one? How about self-care is necessary in order for me to maintain well-being and to give that well-being to others? Um, another one that someone just said was, I don't have, or like, I'm too busy. It's another thing to do. Breaks and taking time out are important, especially in terms of patient safety and safety for myself. 
taking breaks and time out. Time out. Um, what was the other one? It's my, it's, oh, someone said it's my own fault, right? Um, sorry, I'm just trying to go through my little reframe here. What if we said, if I'm burned out, I can't take care of myself or others? <laughs> Rather than it's my fault. You know, I think um, Christina Neff, I don't know if any of you have read her literature, but um, my good friend Maria Marie connected me with her readings and she really talks about um, being a friend to yourself and, and working on this self-talk of like negative, uh, negative self-talk and how we can reframe that. And what I love is she gave this great example of how talk to yourself as you would talk to your closest friend or child. And I love that. Like, why are we so hard on ourselves, right? Because we're type A personalities and we went into this profession <laughs> to, you know, be a perfectionist or whatever those things that made you want to go into this happen. But it also is like a double edge, right? Like that type A, like really perfect person. We also need to learn to be soft with that person and give them self-love. Um, I really appreciate your comments. Next slide. So we talked a little bit about how we're going to identify some of our strategies. And one of them is social support. So, um, you know, I cannot thank my work wives enough. Um, in the ICU, it's a culture that is very close because you need each other. You need a team to admit that crashing GI bleed that needs 18 units of blood. Like you cannot physically do that yourself. But what we know is that social support contributes to recovery from many types of burnout and stress, right? Um, we can make a plan together, you feel supported, you can learn together. Um, and like I said, the University of Washington now has a peer support program that's based on creating social support that is safe. Um, and, you know, go to your supervisors, talk to them about building a, a social support network for your nurses. I know um, it's been extremely difficult with COVID because of, you know, social distancing. Um, but there are a lot of creative ways that you can be together. And we used to always do, um, we used to, but <laughs> we'd have like uh, unit happy hours um, that we could all go and debrief at. And so having social support at work and feeling a collegial um relationship is really, really important. Um, next slide. So next, um, we're going to talk a little bit about cognitive strategies. And I talked to you guys already a little bit about Dr. Christina Neff and her work with, um, you know, talking about self-kindness and remapping your thoughts for that. Um, so perspective taking so that you know right now I think for me it's definitely a challenge that I'm working on and it's the ability to relate and experience um, from different and varied points of view so the idea um, especially when we talk a little bit about mindfulness is this flexibility of thought and not always being so concrete about one thing um, so this allows you to you know have an opportunity from another perspective and then get a fuller appreciation of the situation. Um, I think we can all, maybe we've all had experiences about this with talking um, perhaps with our colleagues or friends about the vaccination and um, you know, some people just not wanting it and how do we navigate those situations? Well, part of that is that perspective taking and obviously letting go, you know, right now, um, there's a lot of choices being made, a lot of choices being made uh, for us. And um, so how do we sort of let go of those thoughts and be self-aware? Um, I think also learning a work-life balance is crucial. I talk to my students all the time about this, um, especially if you're going into fields of medicine like intensive care, 
palliative care, all, all of these areas, primary care, are known to have high rates of burnout. And so how do you sort of navigate that work-life balance? For me, I'll give you some strategies. I turn off my phone at five o'clock and I'm home with my daughter and I'm fam family time. I get up really early to accommodate the work that I need to do. But when I'm not at the hospital, um, I really try to carve out time where I'm not on technology. And that's just one strategy that I find very helpful. Um, would anybody like to share in the chat box about ways that they have learning to balance? All right. Um, oh, so I was going to say, oh, here we go. I always worked at home on Fridays. Thank you. I love that. So taking time, if you can, to telecommute or just not go in and be home, um, having that sort of built into your schedule, I think is a fabulous way to just say, I'm going to carve out this time for myself or not be as busy as I normally am on these work days. Four days a week. Oh, the chat went away. I missed it. Alice, can you put it back up? Somebody said working four days a week. Yes. Um, it. If you click on chat, it should come up. Uh, four days work week, willing to work a longer 12-hour day in order to get a full day off, says Megan. Oh, <clears throat> Megan, I love that. I remind myself that my needs should be prioritized. Yes. Having my family hold me accountable. Yes. These are all really great work-life balance strategies because I think um, especially, I don't know, adult life is kind of crazy. <laughs> so, you know, having people in your life say, hey, you got to be home and I need you here. Um, please carve out a day off for us. I try to do that. You know, Sunday is my day for family dinner. One example. Also sense of humor. I love sense of humor. So in the ICU, we sometimes call this gallows humor. It's not trying to be rude or disrespectful. It, we love what we're doing. We just use humor because sometimes it's just so dang sad that we need to laugh and have a release. So I find watching comedies or, you know, joking with my friends or talking with something completely unrelated to the socio-political world outside, that can really help as well. Okay, next slide. Oh, nursing homes have been really useful lately. Wait, I can't read the whole thing. Oh, wait, here we go. Nursing, nursing homes have been really useful lately. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, I'm sorry. Nursing memes. Memes, yes. <laughs> I thought she said homes. <laughs> no, nursing memes. There's this whole Instagram social. I mean, I find it hilarious. Sometimes you can go down the rabbit hole of um social media, but there are some really lightning, uh, enlightening posts that I find funny. Mindfulness. So uh, mindfulness is everywhere now. And the evidence is just huge on the benefits of meditation. These are just a few of the journals that um, I put on this slide, but there are literally hundreds of evidence-based mindfulness reviews out there. Um, one of, this, one of these journals just did a whole map of evidence for mindfulness. We use it um, at the VA. We have mindfulness groups for PTSD. We have mindfulness groups for um, overeating, undereating, um, stress reduction. It is very, very well now accepted in the medical community. And what I love about it um, is it's using your own brain for your benefit. Um, and it is um, just a, a really easy technique that you can do anywhere. And you may be saying, Des, that's crazy. It's true though. Like I said in the beginning, when we started starting that breath work is essentially what mindfulness is, next slide please, per Dr. Kabat-Zinn, who started the whole mindfulness um, uh, research group in, at Harvard, I believe. Um, is it is being in the present moment 
with awareness and non-judgment. That's it. So it's hard <laughs> because my mind is always future thinking or it wants to go to the past. So is being present, being there. And I, this is what I loved about Dr. Farber when I would watch him in practice is he was so present with his patients and families. He really was in the moment with them. And I think as healthcare workers, when we're in the moment, not trying to always think about the future and the past, what to do next, the to-do list, the checkoffs, the charting, the breaks, we can get into that space where we're allowed to expand and have a creative response. Um, and so that can be a, a combination of things to get you there. It can be breathing exercises, body scans. Um, sometimes I use this little aromatherapy. It's actually hand sanitizer. And I like to spray it to clean my hands, take a breath and get into the moment. Not that crazy, but those are just little things I do throughout the day. Um, is it gonna fix my, all my life's worries? No, but it just helps me kind of get out of that, you know, amygdala mind of fight or flight basically. So that's, what, that's how I use it. Next slide. Um, and then there's some really great evidence out there now about healthcare professionals who use mindfulness um, and helping them with um, stress reduction. So um, I, I listed this study that was done with um, using awareness practice for healthcare professionals. And what was really interesting is when they looked at the two groups that um, had, they did basically, they randomized two groups. They did um, a mindfulness training and then they did just placebo. And what they found were that the stressed healthcare care professionals found stress interactions and empathy as a liability. That was fascinating to me, empathy as a liability. And then with the people that had the training, the group that had the training, they were experienced empathy as a mutually healing connection and were able to have some post-traumatic growth with their patients. So I'll make sure to give Alice this study to you, but I just found that really, really fascinating. Um, so looking at this awareness practice, and I think it was about six weeks, there's a lot of um, research you can do if you're ever interested in a mindfulness-based um, stress reduction program. The University of Washington has one for, I think you can sign up as an employee, but I'm not sure. So check that out. Next slide. Um, so looking at our reactions um, to stress, We've talked a little bit about emotional, relational, occupational, and cognitive. Um, and that cognitive strategy I went over in the previous slides. We'll go to the next slide next. Meaning-based strategies. So this is another strategy to use um, with burnout. And it's focusing on the aspect of work most meaningful to you. So um, this is a picture of my dad and I at my wedding. And um, he passed away at Harborview after he fell from a traumatic brain injury. And when he was passing away, I'd just been a nurse for about a year and a half. Um, we uh, had a lot of discussions with the palliative care providers about um, transitioning him to comfort care. And luckily for me, I knew he would never want aggressive end of life care. And I feel so grateful that we had those conversations because one of the things that I think causes the most moral distress on the unit is when we don't know patients' wishes and families don't know patients' wishes. So if anything from this pandemic, perhaps we can get more aligned with eliciting those goals and documenting them. So when patients have these events, we're not doing untoward suffering. So when I think about my dad and I think about my veterans and my patients, they, they always kind of co-mingle, right? And so that 
meaning of my experience with him um, in that setting and the context of transitioning him to comfort care and withdrawing the mechanical ventilator. I have this very close connection with guiding my families and my staff with other patients like that. So that is a very meaning-based strategy for myself. Next slide. Um, understanding and thinking about workplace values. So um, I think, you know, there are a lot of good things in our workplace. And maybe if they're not good, you can think about what you'd want them to be. And so I think understanding our professional values can give you a greater sense of control um, and a more fulfilling work experience. So, you know, reconnecting to your work and putting energy towards the aspects of your job that you love can definitely help stress and burnout. Maybe that looks like joining um, a professional um, group or doing a journal club or becoming part of your mentor program at the hospital or thinking about staffing or whatever those things mean for you or creating a mindfulness group, you know? Um, workplace values matter. And in this time of like uncertainty and with hospitals so short staffed, you know, leaning into that might be helpful. Um, next slide. So yeah, and then thinking about how your values align with your workplace values or your patient values and how you can really get joy from those things. Um, I work in a team at my job and I have a group of pharmacists who I adore and we always, we have this great teams thing now on our computers and we'll be rounding and you know, um, they'll send me, Des, can you put this order in with an emoji with the sunglasses on? And it just makes, brightens my day. I mean, it's something so simple like that, but they know me and we are a team and having that, um, I don't know, just connection and cooperation with a team has been so helpful. And is part of the reason why I've really stayed at my job. I'm committed to that. I don't want to lose that. And I know they're depending on me too. Um, and with that, I obviously really encourage everyone to recognize and give kudos to people on your team that you love. Um, having that, um, you know, random acts of kindness has definitely been shown to help with burnout and um, your stress. Next slide. So obviously physical strategies, very, very evidence-based. Um, we all know that um, aerobic training can help with all sorts of good hormones and the dopamine response. It can help mitigate depression and anxiety and inflammation, like your body's own inflammatory response. Physical strategies can definitely help with that. And it doesn't have to be crazy. Um, you know, I try sometimes just to get down and take a little walk around our Zen garden. Um, and when I have that time out, I'm not just walking. I'm also mindfully thinking about my day. Um, and that has also been shown to help with um, neurotransmitters and like your brain function. So you're not just doing physical work. You're actually flooding your brain with good hormones. And that really helps the stress response as well. And then next slide. Um, so I would like for us where I've talked a lot, almost an hour, how did that go by so fast? <laughs> Maybe all of you could just either write down or share in the chat one thing you would like to do from this talk to reduce your stress and burnout. And then perhaps maybe sharing like how you prioritize that. Um, I'd love to just give a few minutes pause and, and see what y'all think. Um, you like the hand sanitizer, right? This is um, Susie's Citrus. I'm not being paid by them, but I'm doing it right now and it smells so good. <laughs> um, 
Oh, it's um, it's Suzy's, S U Z I apostrophe S. Yeah, walking meditation. I love that. All right, so we'll move to the next slide. So this is um, some um, links on. Ooh, Tracy says she has an Apple Watch that has a breathing app. I love that. So like timeout breath. Awesome. See technology and wellness more and more together. I love it. Um, so this uh, slide talks about the stop technique. And I found this through the wellnesssociety.org. You can go on to um, all of these uh, links I listed here are free. Um, and actually Headspace is offering free meditations for nurse, for I think healthcare nurses. Um, but what I really found nice, again, mnemonics work for me is so the stop technique is basically when you have these intrusive thoughts or you're feeling really, really stressed out is to basically literally tell your mind, stop, take a breath, maybe spray your Susie's, observe your thoughts and emotions, just bring awareness to the sensations, um, and then kind of be okay with whatever arises for a few minutes. Just be okay with it. And then mindfully consider how you like to respond. So maybe that's nothing. Maybe it's just writing it down. Maybe it's, um, you know, moving on to a different project or moving on to a different discussion. I, I can't talk about that right now. Maybe it's having a boundary, but I thought this was a really helpful technique. Um, you can literally use anywhere in the car, at the bedside, charting. Um, and then they, uh, this site has free worksheets available and there's a lot of different strategies um, that you can utilize. So why do we care about all of this? <laughs> Next slide. Well, um, I think it's just an incredibly important thing right now, if not the most important thing right now for bedside providers. And we know the outcomes show that we have less stress providers, we have better patient outcomes, we have, we have healthier use, you're not gonna call in sick all the time, um, you're gonna be empowered, you're gonna be satisfied, your patients and families be satisfied, and hopefully you won't you know, leave. So we want you to perform well and we want our hospitals and teams to do better. And with that next slide, I do think it's really important for all of us to just keep institutionals accountable. So acknowledging that you have not failed if you're not resilient, if you're having a bad day, um, you know, institutions still need to support us with safe staffing and we need to be prepared with the proper PPE and we need breaks. So um, all of that being said, I can't, I'm not talking about staffing situations on this talk. I'm focusing on you and your roadmap to wellness. And um, my final thoughts are to the next slide, which basically just remembering that not one size fits all. Um, I offered some strategies during this talk that you can utilize or not, but um, just remember that trying to be att pay attention to yourself and noticing your body and your thoughts is really just a very simple step to being aware and, and mindful for yourself. Um, taking a breath, offering kindness, observing yourself, allowing for time and space, um, getting outside as much as you can is really helpful. And again, having a supportive friend or mentor that you trust is crucial. And then, you know, eating a good meal or cooking or lighting a candle. Um, each month uh, after our rotation, our chaplains do um, sort of like a tea for the soul, or we call it soul food. And we basically do a little um, re remembrance legacy for the veterans that have passed on our month together and it's it's really really helpful i encourage all of you guys to to do a you know 
ceremony, right? Of, of recognizing and acknowledging that these people, these patients have come into our lives and they have left our physical world in whatever capacity that means to you. Um, and those ceremonies are, are really, really important. So um, with that, I wanted to just end with a brief poem. And this was from Dr. Stu Farber's memorial service. It was one of his favorite poems. It's called The Late Fragment. And did you get what you wanted from this life? Even so, I did. And what did you want? To call myself beloved, to feel myself beloved on the earth. And I just thought that is so beautiful to call myself beloved, to feel myself beloved on the earth. And um, with that, I just want to again say thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this discussion. Thank you for being part of the, our healthcare communities. We, I just acknowledge you and I appreciate you. And I hope you get some breath and kindness today. Thank you so much, uh, Desiree. Um, does anybody have any questions, any final thoughts that they would like to share? And feel free to put yourselves on video and unmute. Um, so I am going to uh, upload this recording and oh, let's pause.